Great. Okay, so Rabbi Isai, Daftzadi Gimel Amid Aleph, Ret Tashma. What we left off yesterday is a machlokas between Rav and Shmuel, that on financial matters do we go according to Rov, which means do we follow a majority? If we see a pattern that the majority of things go in a certain direction, can we use that as a legal argument in financial court cases? And the example that is being debated here is that Ruvain sells an ox to Shimon, and Shimon discovers that the animal is a goring animal. And it was known that it was a goring animal when Ruvain sold it. Shimon claims false pretense sale. I, th- was plan- I had bought this ox to plow with. Ruvain says, how was I supposed to know you were planning to uh, plow with it? Maybe I thought you wanted to shecht it to eat it. What difference would it make if it's a goring animal or not? So Rav says, you go according to Rov. Most people, most people when they buy an animal, they want the animal for, for plowing, not for eating. And therefore, Shimon has a good claim. His claim is, ah, you, should, you should have known based on what most people do. Shmuel says, no, once the sale is completed, you're not entitled to a refund. If you didn't specify at the time that you were buying it specifically for plowing, how was I supposed to know? And just because most people buy it for that purpose, that's irrelevant in cases of, of monetary law. It may be relevant in other halachas, but it's not relevant in cases of a dispute between two people on money. Okay, that's the machlokas. So the Gemara is now trying to prove one way or the other. So let's take a look now. We're on line two on Daf Tzadi Gimel. Toshma, shor shenaga chesapara v'nimtza ubra b'tzida ve'ino yodua im atshelo nag chayolda o im imishenag chayolda. So here's the case. The case is uh, an ox gores a pregnant cow, and we find a dead cow on the road. And next to the dead cow is a dead fetus. And the only thing that is unknown is we know for sure that the ox killed the cow. There are witnesses to that. What there are not witnesses to, was this fetus miscarried before the cow was gored and died? Or did the cow miscarry as a result of the goring? I'm sorry, is it miscarrying or gave birth? Doesn't really make a difference. It does, the point is, is that this is a this is a calf. It's it's outside the it's outside the mother's body, and it's dead. Because what comes next would make. Hold on, you'll see. Okay, so ad shalonag chayolda o imishonag chayolda. So what's the halach in that case? So we know that the owner of the ox has to pay for sure for the cow. It's a suffix, however. Does he have to pay for the calf? Is the ox responsible for the calf's death or not? So, Mishalim Chatsi Nezek Lepara Uravia Livlat. So, here's the halacha. We know that in the case of a tam, where this is the first time offense of the ox of the active goring, what do you have to pay? Chatsi Nezek. You pay half damages, uh, half the value of the calf. So, for the cow, he's for sure got to pay half the value of the calf. What about the calf? Since we're not sure whether the owner of the ox is responsible for the death of the calf, you've got to pay half of the normal amount. They split it. Because we paskin in this respect like Sumchus, who says, Mamon hamutol besafek cholkin. That if you have a monetary question where there's no muchzak, there's no issue of possession, it's just, a, it's just totally unknown whether the money is owed or not, you split the difference. So therefore... The owner of the ox has to pay for half of the half nezek, which would be a quarter of the value of the calf. So the Gemara says, "Va'amai le'mahelach acharov paros v'rov paros misabros v'yoldos v'havaday machmas negicha hipila." So listen to the Gemara's question. According to Rav, we should go according to the majority. What does the majority tell us? That majority of cows who are pregnant come to full term and give birth to a healthy calf that is viable, that lives. So the fact that this calf appears to us as dead on the side of the road should be an indication, if we're going to follow majority, should be an indication that it's definitely been gored by the ox and the ox is responsible for the calf's death. There shouldn't be a suffix. So it's a kasha on Rav. Why is it only a suffix where he has to pay half? He should have to pay the full amount according to you, Rav. So the Gemara says no. 
Hasa mishum de safm de mesaf galon de ikola memor mi kama asa ume bi asusa ipila, bi ikola memor me achora asa umin gach nag chavi ipila. Havi maman hamutal besafek, the chol maman hamutal besafek cholkim. So the answer is, is that according to Rav, you know what? We do go according to majority, and we do assume that it was because of the ox that this calf is dead. But here's our question. We have a different question. Not whether we follow the majority that tells us that this ox definitely caused the death of the calf. But how did it cause the death of the calf? You see, there are two ways that the, the ox could have caused the death of the, of the calf. Either if it came from the rear of the animal, the animal was not aware that there was a charging bull coming at it. It got gored from behind totally by surprise, and therefore it died and its calf died. In that case, the ox is re directly responsible for the death of the mother and the death of the calf. But there's another way, and that is if it came from a frontal attack so that the cow saw it, it coming from a distance. Any pregnant cow, and the truth is it's true with pregnant humans as well, a pregnant cow, when it sees a charging bull, might have miscarried the calf not from the impact, not from the trauma, but rather from the fright of seeing a bull charging. Now, if indeed the calf died as a result of fright and not as a result of the trauma, <coughs> the owner of the, uh, the bull is not responsible for that. That's what we would call a grumma. It's a non-physical causation of damage not a direct physical, direct impact. So therefore, that's the issue. The issue is, we, we know that the ox is responsible for the calf's death, but did it cause the death directly through physical impact, or did it cause it through fear, in which case the owner would not be chayev. So that's how Rav would look at this suffix on the calf. So lema kitanai. So the Gemara says, okay, fine. But let's suggest that the machlokas between Rav and Shmuel is actually a machlokas tanoi. What does the Brisa say? Shor shahayaroe, v'nimtza shor haruv b'tzido, afal pi shazem menugach v'zem mu'ad ligach, zem menushach v'zem mu'ad lishauch, ain omrim biyadua shazen agcho v'zen nashcho. The Tanakam of this Brisa states as follows. You're looking at a herd of, of bulls. And you see one healthy bull that's a little bit aggressive, and you see a dead bull <coughs> lying right next to it. Even though you know that the living bull is uh, aggressive and known to be goring, we don't automatically assume that the dead bull is a result of this bull. Who knows? Maybe it was a different bull that's not here anymore. So therefore, the Tanakhama says, <coughs> don't make any assumptions. Rabbi Acha Oimer, Gamal HaOcher Ben HaGimalim, Venimsa Gamal HaRuv Bitzido, Biyadua Shezeh HaRago. Rabbi Acha says, I disagree. Not only do we make assumptions by bulls who are more aggressive by their nature, but even when it comes to camels who are more docile by nature, if you see that one camel is in heat, in this, in, you know, because it's time for it to mate, and the animals become more aggressive at that time, and you see right next to this camel in heat, you see a dead camel, you can assume for sure that this camel killed that camel, and therefore the owner of the living camel has to pay for the cost of the dead camel. So, now, Sevaruha deruba v'chazake ki hadadi ninu. Now, this is not going, uh, this is not using the principle of rove, which is the majority of X behaves in a certain way, but rather it's called a chazaka which means you're not looking at a majority of a pool of things, but you're looking at the, the creature or the item at, at hand. And you're saying, is this animal known to be a goring animal? So in the case of both the camel and the bull, yes, this animal is known to be a goring animal. It has a chazaka. It has already established a pattern of being an aggressive animal. And so our thinking is, at this point, when looking at this uh, brisa, there's really no difference between a chazaka and a rove. They both help us establish an assumption of fact. And if it's true that we can make a chazaka assumption about this animal and say that the fact that this animal is aggressive, according to Rebbe Acha, allows us to assume that it killed the camel, so too we can follow a rove, a majority opinion, 
and say that if a majority of people purchase uh, animals for plowing, we can follow that assumption as well. So, Lema Rav Da'amar Karebi Acha, Ushmul Da'amar Kitanakam. And therefore, on that basis, it would seem that this Brisa is the same machlokis as Rav and Shmuel. Do you follow, can, can you create uh, facts based on assumptions, either a rover, a chazaka, or assumption, or not? So the Tanakama holds that you cannot, like Shmuel, and, the, and Rabbi Acha says that you can make assumptions based upon um, patterns or, or uh, es- es- established precedents, and, uh, and therefore that would go like Rav. So the Gemara says, not necessarily. Amr lecha rav, ana da amri afilu l'tanakama, because ad kan lo kamr tanakama hasam el adilo azlinan basar chazaka, aval basar ruba azlinan. Rav would tell you, no, maybe there's a difference between a rov and a chazaka. Both of them are working on assumptions. But uh, chazaka is, look at this particular animal. Is there an assumption of its aggressiveness, yes or no? Well, maybe yes, but that doesn't give us a right to assume that it killed the animal. Maybe, so Rav would tell you like this, the only time that I follow assumptions is if you're looking at a pool of subjects and you say the majority behave in a certain way. That's when I say that you use the principle of Rov to establish fact and to make assumptions of fact. Right? But when it comes to looking at Chazaka, I don't hold that you use Chazaka as an establishment of fact. I only hold that you use rope. So it could be that I could hold like the Tanakama over there who says that you cannot assess the owner of the live bull based upon the fact that there's a dead bull next to it. Uh, but I still hold that if a guy says, I bought this animal for plowing, then he has a legitimate claim. Ushmul amr lecha anadam riafil le rebi acha. Ad kan lo ka amr rebi acha hasana le dazlin un basar chazaka du hu gufe muhsa. Aval basar ruba lo azlin on. And Shmuel might argue the exact opposite argument. He could tell you, you know what, the reason why I disagree with Rav in the case where a guy buys an animal for plowing is because you're reliant on what's called a ruba de lesa kaman. You're reliant upon a pool of subjects that are not currently in, in front of us. What does that mean? In other words, the argument that the buyer is making is that when I bought this animal, you should have known that I was buying it for plowing because most people in the Velt purchase animals for plowing. Well, where are those people? Can you point them to me? No, they're just, they're out there. They're not here in the room with me. They're out there in the general population. So that's, that's a weaker argument than looking at a subject that's right here in front of me and saying, look, it's an aggressive animal. So Shmuel's argument would be, when you have a subject that's right in front of you, that establishes a pattern of a certain behavior, you can make assumptions based on the established subject, like the animal that's right in front of you. That's the idea of chazaka. But when you're going according to a rove that's not in front of you, that's too nebulous, and therefore Shmuel would say, that's why I disagree with Rav over there, but I could agree with potentially with Rav Acha in that b'risa. So you have no raya that this b'risa is consistent with the machlokis of Rav and Shmuel. Tashma. Now let's go to the Mishnah that we saw yesterday. What did the Mishnah say? The whole reason why this whole story got started is because we learned the Mishnah yesterday at the beginning of the parak, which states that if Shimon buys um, produce from Ruven, and he takes, let's say he buys wheat or barley, and he plants it because that's what he wants to use it for, so the halacha is, is that if nebach, these, this barley or wheat, doesn't grow into, into stalks, he has no taina against the seller, because the seller could say, how was I supposed to know that you were planning to use this for planting? That I should have made sure that it's, a, uh, that it's usable for seed. You didn't tell me that you were going to use it for seeding. And that's true even if the sale is on flaxseed. Because why? Because some people use flaxseed for food. Even today, people consume flaxseed for health. It's, a, it's got health benefits, right? People eat flax. How was I supposed to know you're planning to plant it? So, so the Mishnah says, my afilu, la, uh, my afilu. Why does the Mishnah say that that's true even if the guy purchases flaxseed? He says, 
because with flaxseed you have a majority. Now, what is the majority by flaxseed? It's um, uh, that most flaxseed that is purchased in the world is purchased for planting. Now, it's true that some flaxseed that is purchased is purchased for eating, but the majority of flaxseed that is purchased in the veld is purchased for, for, for planting because you get, you know, uh, flax plants are, are lucrative. You can make linen out of them. So, uh, so the argument is that maybe this is Mishnah is a proof against Rav. Because according to Rav, if you can go according to Rove, you don't go to, if you go according to the majority, why can't the buyer say, you should have known that I was purchasing the flaxseed for planting because most flaxseed is sold for planting. And uh, the fact that we don't allow him to say that isn't that proof that Rav is mistaken based on our Mishnah. So the Gemara says, you're right, but it's a Tanoi, but it's a Machlokas Tanoim from the following. The Tanya, Hamocher peros lechavero v'zorin v'lotsam, chuzir onigino she'en ne'achol en chayiv ba'achro yusan, zera pishtan eno chayiv ba'achro yusan. The Bryce states as follows. If a person buys seed, then it depends what kind of seed. If it's like wheat or barley or even flaxseed, since it could potentially be used for food as well as planting, the buyer has no recourse if he plants it and it doesn't grow. However, if he buys garden seeds, you know, like flower seeds, you know, those pack of seeds for 69 cents, you know, or you, from the back, of, or the back of the comic book, you know. Radish for, seeds. It could be radish, radish seeds, right? Stuff, whatever, stuff, things that you can't eat as food, right? But things that you, you buy a packet of seeds to plant them in your garden, whatever it is, the point is that there it's not a question of row. There's only one purpose, there's only one function for those seeds, and in that case, if a guy plants them and, he, and they don't grow, then he does have legal <coughs> recourse against the seller. But Rabbi Yossi Omer, no saying lo, deme zera. Rabbi Yossi says, no, I hold even for flaxseed. The guy can demand a refund because the seller should have known. So Amru lo, so then there's a third voice that now chimes in into this b'risa, and they say to him as follows, har lo chanoso lidvarim acher. That no, with flaxseed too, many people buy it for other purposes. Now, what does this mean? How is this third voice different from the Tanakhama? So the Rashbam very, very wisely states as follows: the difference between the Tanakhama and the third voice of this brisa is that the Tanakhama says we don't reckon with majorities at all, by virtue of the fact that people uh, that there's patterns of purchase is totally irrelevant. As long as it's conceivable that a person could be purchasing it for food, then the buyer has no legal recourse. Rabiosi, however, disagrees, and he says that as long as the majority of flaxseed that is sold on the market is sold for planting, then the buyer has legal recourse. The third voice says, you're making a mistake by looking at the subject as being the flaxseed. The subject is the number of buyers in the market. And what his argument is like this, even if it's true that the majority of flaxseed that's sold on the marketplace is uh, sold for planting, but that's irrelevant. The relevant issue is the people in the world, when they buy flaxseed, is there a significant majority <coughs> that buys it for purposes other than planting? Because at the end of the day, you would look at it like this. Let's say there are a, a million bushels of flaxseed that are sold in the world every year. Okay, ninety percent of that of that million bushels is sold for planting, and only ten percent is sold for eating. According to this third voice, that's irrelevant because you have to look at the way people buy flaxseed. It may be true that an individual purchaser may buy 100 bushels of flaxseed and use 90 of it for planting and 10 of it, of it for, for eating. But that's not the, but if at the end of the day, the majority of people always, uh, you know, if, if the, you have to look at the number of people who are buying flaxseed. And his argument is, is that the criterion is not the volume of flaxseed that's sold, 
but the different kinds of people. If everyone would be buying flaxseed for planting, and only a small minority of people would be buying flaxseed for food, then that would make a difference, and you could say that the buyer is entitled to a refund. But that's not the reality. The reality is, is that a whole bunch of people in the world buy flaxseed for eating. And even though it's true that even the people who buy flaxseed for eating still use the majority of the flaxseed that they purchase for planting, but as long as you can establish that more than 50% of people who purchase flaxseed use some of it for eating, then the buyer has no legal recourse. Because the seller could always say, how did I know that you were going to be, that, uh, that you were going to take that particular amount of flaxseed and going to be using it for planting. Maybe you were going to be using it for eating or some other utility. Because I know that there's a large majority of people who use flaxseed for other purposes. So therefore, we don't look at this particular person as far as how much flaxseed you're going to be using for planting and how much flaxseed you're going to be using it for eating. But we look at the people in the world and we look at, um, we look at if they constitute the majority or not. And that's the argument against Rabbi Yossi. So, man tanoi. So, what, when you say that Rav and Shmuel are arguing in a machlokas tanoim, who, who, which, are, which two opinions out of these three opinions are the voices of Rav and Shmuel? Ilema Rav Yossi v'amrulo to Ravayu basar ruba azli. Maros or basal ruba de inshiu. Maros or basal ruba de zria. He says it can't be that the two voices are Rav Yossi and the third voice of the Mishnah. Because those, both of those opinions that you follow rove. The only machlokas is do you follow the majority of seeds sold on the market? That's Rav Yossi. And he says since the majority of seeds sold on the market are for planting, then the buyer has legal recourse. But the Amrulo, the third voice of the Brisa, says no. It's true that the majority of seeds may be sold for planting, but the majority of buyers buy it for, multi, for multi-purpose. And therefore the uh, buyer does not have legal recourse. But both of them follow the principle of rove, and Shmuel says you don't follow rove at all. So, Ela itan akam of Rav Yossi, itan akam of The answer is, what we're saying, is that Rav and Shmuel, based their machlokis, is that Shmuel definitely holds like the Tanakama, and Rav, who says you follow rove, either follows the opinion of Rav Yossi or the third voice of this Amrulo, this Yesha Omer. So the bottom line is, is that the conclusion of the Gemara in this discussion is that Rav and Shmuel's machlokes is a machlokes tanoim. Our Mishnah clearly says you don't follow rove, because our Mishnah says that uh, you never use rove as an argument for, um, for, for, the, for, the perp- for the purchase of seeds, regardless of what the majority use of the seeds are. The fact is, is that even if there's a minority that uses it for consumption, the buyer has no legal recourse. Tana Rabbana. Mahu no sein lo dumei zera v'lo hotza v'yesh omer maf hotza. So now the next question that the Brisa undertakes is, assuming that the buyer is entitled to a refund because he bought garden seeds and they didn't grow. Because in the case of garden seeds, there we establish that since the exclusive use of those garden seeds is only for planting, if they don't grow, the buyer is entitled to the refund, to a refund. But there's a machlokas, what refund he's entitled to. So the Tanakhama says that he's only entitled to the 69 cents that he paid for the pack of seeds. I don't think it's, I mean, that's when I was a kid, it was 69 cents. It's probably a little bit, little bit more by now. Uh, right? And the Yesh Omrim, that not only is entitled to the value of the pack of seeds, but he's also entitled to whatever expenses. Look, he, he went to Home Depot, he bought a pack of seeds, he bought a... Uh, a uh, 20 kilos of fertilizer. He bought uh, tools and shovels. And then he found some Mexicans on the side of the road at the Home Depot. Oh, you're in California? Yeah, I'm from California. So <laughs> in California, when you go to Home Depot, <laughs> you, you, you see a line of guys willing to work uh, for you know less than minimum wage. You, 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 you have them jump in the back of your pickup, and you take them home with you, and you have them, you have them plant. plant. <laughs> right, it's an inside American joke, right? And then so that, and then you have them planned for you. So there's the expenses for all of these other things. So the Yesh Omrim say that not only are you entitled to get your money back for the seeds, but all of the other investments that you put into it, you're entitled to comp- get compensated. So man Yesh Omrim. So who is this Yesh Omrim? So Amar Rav Chizda, Rav Shimon Gamlieli. Oh, it's Rav Shimon Gamlieli. 
Now the question is, hey, Rav Shimon Gamliel, which Rav Shimon Gamliel uh, citation are you saying that this goes like? So Elin Rav Shimon Gamliel de Masnisen. Well, we know that Rav Shimon Gamliel is quoted in our Mishnah. Did Naan Hamocher Peros Lechavero Bezarin Belot Samchu Vafilu Zera Pishtan Eno Chayv Baach Rayusim. So the first part of our Mishnah said that according to the Tanakama, if you purchase seeds and they don't grow. You're not entitled, to, even if it's flaxseed, you're not entitled to, uh, to any, le- you, have, you have no legal recourse. And aim a safe, and then the, the safe of that, of our Mishnah says, Rav Shimon Gamliel Omer is your own Egin, Shinin Echol, and Chayv Bach Rav Shimon Gamliel says that when you buy garden seeds, you ought, the, the buyer does have legal recourse. Now the question is, Tanakama Nami Hachi Ka'amar, Zerah Pishtan Hudeinu Chayv Bach Ryusen, Azir Oni Gina, Shinin Echol, and Chayv Bach Ryusen. The question is, what's the machlokus between the Tanakhama and Rav Shimon Gamliel? Because it would seem that the Tanakhama also agrees that if you can't assume that the seeds are used for anything other than planting, right? Because the only thing that the Tanakhama says that the buyer is not entitled to a refund on are seeds which are sometimes used for eating as well, like flaxseed. But the, by implication, it sounds like if it's exclusively used for planting, he would agree with Rav Shimon Gamliel that you're entitled to a refund. So what's the machlokis? So el alav hotza yika beinai, umar savr de mezer, umar savr af hotza. So you have to conclude that the machlokis between the two of them is something that's not explicit, but rather implied. So what's the machlokis? Let's suggest that the Tanakama holds that he's only entitled, when it's garden seeds, he's only entitled to get the 69 cents. And Rosh Hashanah Gamliel says he gets the seeds value plus all of the expenses as well. Mimai, so how do you know? Maybe not, because Dilma Ipcha. Maybe it's the opposite. Maybe the Tanakama is the one who says you're entitled to the seeds plus expenses, and Rishim and Gamliel says you're only entitled to the seeds. Umar says, no, that, that question is halokasha, because kol Tanabasul it's for Yamilsa Kaasi. Anytime you have a pattern of A says this and B says this, it's always assumed that B is coming to add on to something that A had said. So if A says you're chayef for seeds, B is the one who's going to say you're chayef for seeds plus expenses. That's the standard pattern of a mission, right? So therefore, you can't say that maybe it's reverse. It must be that this is Rav Shem But the Gemara says, but I still have a question, because you're making an assumption that they're arguing about something that is not written at all in our mission. And therefore, if you're going to reinterpret the Mishnah, you might as well reinterpret it in a more straightforward way, because V'dil Makula Rav Shem Maybe the way you have to read our Mishnah, since there doesn't seem to be any explicit machlokas between the Tanakhama and Rav Shimon Gamliel, is that our Mishnah is entirely Rav Shimon Gamliel, and there's no machlokas in our Mishnah. And really the way you read it is, is Hamocher peros lechavero, bizarin velot samcha, filo zera tishtan, eno chayv bachro yusun divre Rav Shimon Gamliel, Rav Shimon Gamliel omer zir one gina, shenin echol en chayv bachro yusun. That really the whole Mishnah is Rav Shimon Gamliel, that and the halacha that Rishim Gamliel states is that when you buy <coughs> seeds that are edible, you're, and they, you plant them and they don't grow, you're not entitled to a refund. But if you buy garden seeds which are not meant for food at all, then you are entitled to a refund because Rishim Gamliel holds that uh, if there's no other possible use for these seeds, then obviously if they're duds, you're entitled to a refund. So the Gemara says you're right. There's nothing implied in our Mishnah that would indicate the Rishim and Gamliel holds that you're entitled to the expenses added on to the cost of the seeds. There's, there's nothing there in our Mishnah that would, that would lead us to conclude that. So Ella, it has to be a different Rishim and Gamliel. Ella har Rishim and Gamliel, the Tanya, from the following b'raisa. Hamoli chitin litchon velo l'sasan, v'yasa ansu ben omorsan. Kemach lenachtom v'yafo pas nifolin, v'hema letabach v'nibla. So the b'raisa gives three examples of cases where you give raw ingredients to a professional and he ruins the product. The first example is you take grain and you give it to a miller for the purposes of milling it into flour. And the way the, the normal process is, what is a miller supposed to do before he grinds it into flour? He's supposed to separate the chaff from the wheat, <coughs> remove the husks, whatever he's supposed to do. It requires scalding the wheat first, I think, in boiling water, and so that you remove the bran, and then you mill it. But this guy did not do that. He milled the whole thing together with the husks or with the, with the bran, 
And the guy gets this really inferior quality meal instead of getting flour. So the guy, so, I t so uh, the customer goes to the professionals, you ruined this for me. Second example is I give flour to a baker to ask him to bake loaves of bread, and he bakes bread which is crumbly. It's not real bread. It's ruined bread. And the third example is where I take an animal to a shaykhet and say, I'm making, a, I'm serving 50 guests tonight at my son's wedding. Please shech the animal and cut it into pieces so that I can uh, serve my guests the barbecue for tonight. The guy takes the animal and messes up the shechita. It was a perfectly good animal, but he didn't know how to hold the knife properly, and he made the animal into a nevela. So in all three cases, chayef mipneshu kenosei sachar. So the Tanakhama says you have to replace the value of the merchandise of the raw commodities that he gave you. Um, because since you're getting paid for your services, you have a din of a nosei sachar, someone who is using a commodity for pay, and therefore you have a chrayas unless it was a total onus. If this wasn't an onus, this was through your own negligence, through your own uh, bung bungling of the job, and therefore you have to you have to make good on it, right? So Rav Shimon Gamliel Omer no sin lo demei boshto u demei boshas archa. Rav Shimon Gamliel says you have to pay the cost of the commodity plus plus the embarrassment. You have to pay for the embarrassment that was caused to the the bal simcha, the guy who was making the party, and you have to pay all the guests also for having come to a party where no food is being served, right? And boshos and masik. Well, well, whatever we're going to call it, it, I don't think, I mean, in a sense, he's a mazik. But the point is, is that the question is, what is the basis for that? That's a valid question. So it sounds like from the Rashbam that it's a knas. It's a special penalty that was imposed to prevent a person from being negligent with someone else's commodities. This is a very important halacha for caterers. They established the standard in the city of Yerushalayim that if you give raw food to a caterer to prepare and he ends up messing, spoiling all the food. So not only does he have to pay you for the ingredients, but he also has to pay, well, they have like caterer's insurance today. He's got to pay for the spoiled party for it and all of the guests who come to the party and don't have what to eat. He's got to pay for them as well. Another great minute that there was in Yerushalayim, Mapa Prusa Gabi HaPesach, Kozman Shemapa Prusa Orcha Nichnasen, Nistalka Mapa in Orcha Nichnasen. That there was a practice in Yerushalayim that if you wanted to know whether you were welcome, if there was room at a person's house for you to stay, the guest, the host would put out a welcome mat in front of the door. And if the welcome mat was there, you knew that you could knock on the door and seek lodging. If there was no welcome at outside the door, you knew that the house was full. They can see so. Too bad we don't have that minog here today. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I have a feeling everyone would, there wouldn't be any welcome mats outside. <laughs> but anyway, that was the minog in Yerushalayim. Next Mishnah. Hamocher pe so anyway, the, at the end of the day, we see that this is the Rashita of Shem Gamliel, that the guy is not only entitled to compensation for the seeds, but also the expenses. Let's go to the next mission. But with regard to the expenses, couldn't the other person argue, you could use your shovel for other things. Why, why do you have to tie it with Poss the, Possibly, the yes. Fertilizers for other products. Well, no. I mean, if I, oh, if, if, if I can demonstrate that I poured the fertilizer right, directly right, over the seed. But the shovel you can Maybe use the shovel you can make an right. argument. The labor costs, you can't, you, it's clear that it was only for this. Now, uh, you know, even today, what, what do they, in Canada, what do you, we, in the United States we call it the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. Well, you, I'm sure you have something like that in Canada where they regulate what's, what's contained in the food that is sold commercially, right? You see what it looks like in the States. Right, so do you remember that in the States years ago they, they, they showed that there was an acceptable amount of rat hair and rat droppings that you could have in a chocolate bar, something mm. like that, or, if I recall right. Yum. There's, a, there's an acceptable, what? Yum. <laughs> there's an acceptable amount of waste, is what the mission is saying, that when you buy, let's say, grain, there's an acceptable amount of waste product that you can't sue the seller for and say, hey, I didn't buy this, right? You, you have to deduct that from the cost. 
So what is that? So it's a quarter of a kav per sa'a of grain. It's acceptable for it to be dirt. Because, you know, as much as you clean the grain, there's always going to be some dirt or pebbles mixed in with the grain. It's just it's unavoidable. And to be a stickler on that small amount is unreasonable as a purchaser. That's essentially what the mission is saying. Te'ena mekabal lav eser mitola When you buy figs, an acceptable amount of wormy figs is 10%. More than 10% is unacceptable. And marte shal yain mekabal lav eser kuskosasos lameya. If you buy an entire wine cellar, it's assumed that you can have up to 10% of the wine as bad wine. Um, that's because that's an acceptable margin of when you're buying it in such bulk. Kankanan bisharon mekabalav eser putasos pitasos lamea. And finally, when you're buying jugs, earthenware jugs in this area called the Sharon, where they were big manufacturers of jugs, and you're buying them in bulk, it's acceptable that 10% of the jugs should be very fragile or breakable, you know, like they're, like they're, uh, they're, they're bad jugs. They, like, seem like, they seem like large numbers. Right? Yeah, well, it's it probably because the way that these were sold was in bulk. And so it's acceptable for certain commodities to have up to 10% of stuff that's less, less than fully desirable. I guess with wormy figs, you could still use it to feed to your animals and stuff, so... Anyway, the Gemara now says, well, this will finish. Tani Rav Kitina Rova Kitnis Lasa Ba'afroris Rov Kitnis Lasa. Rav Kitina said that he understands the Bryce, the, the Mishnah to mean that an acceptable amount of waste product in the wheat, the waste product is not dirt, but rather legumes. Let's say, you know, like uh, a lot of times, you know, when you have silos of different dried goods, Sometimes there's some mixing. So what we say up to a quarter of a cob in a saw is not dirt, but rather beans. By the way, this was relevant on Pesach. Someone asked me, Rabbi, I, uh, I found quinoa, that's, uh, but it doesn't say that it's kosher le Pesach. Can I use it on Pesach? And what's the answer? The answer is no. Why? Because even though quinoa is not kidneyous, but if they don't store it, under hashkacha to make sure that it's completely segregated from any of the five grains, you have to be choshesh that it may have been contaminated. Listen, uh, you ever see the ingredients on a package that uh, caution may contain soy, and you know that there's no soy in the ingredients. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Because of cross-contamination in the manufacturing or in the storage. So that's what we're saying over here. So the, uh, so the Gemara says, Va'afro is low. But how can you, so you, you're telling me that if there's dirt or pebbles in the wheat, a buyer is entitled to be, uh, to be refunded for that amount? But Rabbah was quoted as saying just the opposite, that if you remove a pebble from a merchant's wheat, then you have to compensate him for the weight of that pebble, because when he sells it, he's allowed to sell the pebble included in the wheat. <laughs> so you're just actually making him spend more money on wheat when he sells it. So you see that pebbles are an acceptable waste product within wheat. So the Gemara answers, kitnis rova, afroris pachos me rova. Gemara answers, you're right. But the acceptable amount of dirt or pebbles within wheat has to be less than a quarter of a cow. But you can have up to a quarter of a cow and including a quarter of a cow of legumes mixed into wheat. That's all that Rav Katina was trying to point out. And we'll hold it here for today. Kaddish, Rabbi Chanan, Rabbi Kasha, Omer